right, here we are on another Lord's Day. Praise God. He's good, isn't He? Is He not worthy? He is worthy. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, there we go. My sister is here from Tennessee, and she told me last week, she said, what is going on? I only got like, can I get an amen one time? She's like, I need about 15 more of those. And I thought, you know what? You're right. I was slipping. And so we're all about the amens up here. Amen. All right. Thank you. Well, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, please turn with me to John chapter 7. And if you need a Bible, there should be one somewhere uh, nearby, in a chair nearby. And uh, we're going to pick up in John chapter 7, verse 40, and we're going to continue our journey through the gospel of John. Father, we love you. I am so delighted to be able to stand before your people today and to open your word and to simply teach the scriptures simply. I thank you for everyone that you have brought here today, and I pray that you would bless them in a very special and deep and profound way as we open the scriptures and look into your word. Thank you that your word is living, it's powerful, it's active, it's sharp. Lord, it's able to pierce into our hearts and our inmost beings, and I pray that you, Lord, would speak to us by your all-sufficient, inspired word. We love you, Father. We, we praise you. We trust you. We celebrate Christ crucified and risen and ascended and seated at the right hand of majesty even now, interceding on our behalf. And so we thank you. We give, our, give you our hearts and we give you our attention. God, please speak to us now and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so as I mentioned last week, the Gospel of John, it's 21 chapters and the first 12 chapters is really Jesus' public ministry. He's uh, going throughout Israel, predominantly in the northernmost part of Israel and Galilee and He's preaching and teaching and doing miracles. And then in chapter, at the end of chapter 12, chapters 13 through 17, that's a very intimate setting where Jesus is ministering to his disciples. He's going to be crucified the following morning. And he spends these last hours, very intimate hours, with the disciples, pouring into them. And then we know, of course, chapters 18 through 21, that is Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And so here we are still in this first portion of John, the first 12 chapters, specifically in John chapter 7. Does anybody remember in John chapter 20, we're told why the book was written, these stories were compiled, it's for a very specific purpose. Anybody know that? So that we would believe, so that we would know that Jesus is the Son of God and believe. And having believed, what would be the outcome, the result of that? Hmm? Come on, don't be shy. We're, we're, this is the church. Come on. What is the outcome of believing in Jesus? We that we would have eternal life. Amen. And so that's, that's John's goal. Well, Jesus is here in the midst of his people, the Jews, and he is proclaiming the truth of who he is. Yet there is mass confusion. There is much ignorance regarding the person of Jesus and the, the purpose of Jesus but nonetheless, Jesus has come to make himself known. And what we see in chapters 7 and 8 are really um, widespread ignorance and ultimately rejection, much hostility against the person of Jesus. And that's what we really see happening in chapters 7 and 8. And so um, we are specifically at the Feast of Tabernacles. You remember that? Everybody remember that? We are in the Feast of Tabernacles. So just a little quick recap on that. Um, that's probably a word that we don't often use in our day-to-day -day language, tabernacle, right? So what is a tabernacle? In its simplest sense, it's, it's a dwelling place. It's a tent. It's uh, sometimes referred to as the tent of meeting. And uh, that's simply what the word tabernacle means. But then there's the tabernacle. There is the tabernacle. And that was God's dwelling place in the Old Testament. That's where God met with his people uh, in the wilderness wanderings during that, that era. And so I got a couple of slides. 
take a look at this because this is important for the setting today that we are in. So this is, uh, this is what the tabernacle was. This is just a tent. And so all of this was made to be able to break it down, pack it up, and move it to the next place as they were wandering in the wilderness. And then they would stop, they would set up, and they would camp all around it. And so here is the actual, the Holy of Holies, and the priests would be doing their priestly duties out here in the court area. But as you can see, it's just one very large tent. So that is the tabernacle. This is before the, the temple was built. And uh, let's switch to the next slide. This would be, this is, um, Abraham Lincoln actually took this picture. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Just <laughs> random. Random. Uh, not true. I saw, uh, I saw something once that said it was a quote. It said, don't believe everything that you see on the internet, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and so, anyways. But uh, this is kind of what it would have looked like. You know, this is a real life model of it, and that's, that's pretty cool. And uh, why don't we go to the next one. And this would be kind of the idea of when they were in the wilderness, and you have the tent of meeting here, and it would be right in the center of the camp, and then you would have all of Israel broken up according to their various tribes all the way around it. And so this is all very significant to the context of our, our story today. And so we'll just kind of stop there. i got one more slide I'll show a little later. And so we're at the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now there were seven feasts that were given to us in Leviticus 23, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, tabernacles, and then Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And so that was six, wasn't it? One, two, three, four, five, six. I could be wrong, but maybe the Sabbath is considered one of those. I don't know. Anyways, go look at Leviticus 23. So, anyways, um, this was a major annual pilgrimage. That would happen every year, obviously, annually, and every male had to attend. And it was a great time of celebration. It was a seven-day feast, and the people would construct little makeshift uh, tents there, and they would uh, remember their time of wandering in the wilderness and God being in their midst. And so that's what this feast was for, and it was a great time of celebration. There was a lot of symbolism uh, even beyond the, the tents, which we will kind of get into today. And so what this is, is remembering the time when God dwelled amongst His people. When God was dwelling amongst His people in a very special way there in the wilderness. And that's what they are looking back to. That's what they are ultimately remembering. Now, we know that Jesus is the actual fulfillment of that. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. We know that everything that happened in the Old Testament, those were types and shadows, but Jesus was the substance. What do, I, what do I mean by that? Those things pointed to something much more deep and significant and special in God's divine plan of salvation. And people even back then didn't realize this, but when Christ came and revealed himself, and fulfilled these things, ultimately and finally, you begin to see how Christ was the subject of the Old Testament all along. And so those things were just shadows of the substance. What do I mean by that? Well, my wife, for instance. I love my wife. I adore my wife. When I am with her, I don't see her shadow on the ground and say, dang, girl, that shadow's got it going on. <laughs> all right, I don't do that. I look at my wife. She's the substance, right? And so Christ has come. We don't really look back to the Old Testament and say, man, that's, where, that's where it was, what it was really about. No, Jesus is the fulfillment of those things. And all of those things point to him. And so we see this today as Jesus makes that very clear, that he is indeed the fulfillment of those things. And the longer I spend in this introduction, I don't even know if we're going to get there. So Jesus came John 1 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth Jesus came and he has dwelt amongst his people amen and so we have a God who is with us God with us you know it was said of Jesus in the Old Testament the Messiah would come and his name would be Emmanuel what does that mean? God with us. That's right. God with us. 
And that is the reality. That is the blessed hope. God is with us in Jesus Christ. Now, the people there had no idea. God was in their midst, and they didn't even know it. Now, for us as Christians, we can fall into the same trap. We know God is with us, but as we live our lives day to day, we forget that God is with us, don't we? We allow the struggles, the temptations, the difficulties to cloud, to cloud you know, our, our knowledge of the truth, and we begin to forget. And so we have to be mindful of this glorious reality that God is with us. God not only dwells among His people, He dwells within His people. Our God is a very present help in time of need, Psalm 46. He is not only God with us, He is God for us. Amen? He is God for us. Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Man, God is for us. God is with us. Christ is in us by the Holy Spirit. And if God was willing to pay such a high price when we were enemies, when God, if God was willing to send His one and only Son to die for us, to reconcile him to us to Himself, what, what, is he, what would He withhold from us now that we are His beloved children in Christ? What good thing would He withhold from those whom He loves? So that is the blessed reality. I hope that we are all encouraged by that today. We need encouragement in this life, don't we? We need hope. We need, we need something that's going to get us by just one more day, one more week. And there it is. This is the blessed hope, the living hope, that our God lives, that our Savior lives, and that He is with us, that He is in us, and He is for us. Good. Amen? Amen? Amen, that's good. I love my brother back there. That's good. Yes, sir. So with that, let's go ahead and get into chapter 7, verse 40. So last week, we kind of closed where Jesus, in the middle of the feast, on the great day of the feast, so it's actually the last day of the feast, he cries out that uh, if anyone is thirsty, they can come to him and drink, and out of their hearts will flow rivers of living water. And then we're told that he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, who would come when Jesus is glorified. We talked about all the blessed privileges, everything that is ours because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so after that statement, verse 40, Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. So again, we see a wide range of opinions concerning Jesus. People hear these wonderful words from Jesus, and they say, this is truly the prophet. Remember, some people had just said in our previous study, what more must someone do to demonstrate that they have come from God? Is the Messiah going to do even more than this man has done? But then some people say, well, you know, this guy's from Galilee, and we know that the prophet is going to come from Bethlehem. Now, where did Jesus come from? Bethlehem. But they didn't even know that, right? They just assumed. They made these assumptions because Jesus was raised in the, uh, the region of Galilee, that's, you know, what they thought. So therefore, you know, Micah 5, 2, they understood that to be a prophecy of where the Messiah would come from. And uh, they said, there it is. He ain't the one, right? And so this is a real trap. This is something that can be very dangerous, something that we have to watch out for. Familiarity. We know this guy. We know where he's from. We've seen him grow up. We know who his parents are. He ain't the one. They thought they knew, but they did not know. This is surface level knowledge. Never really seeking to go deeper, to investigate, to understand the true truth. These are false assumptions. And that is so very dangerous. First, for unbelievers, that's a trap that many never get past. They think they know, but they don't know. Right? 
They have all kinds of false assumptions about Jesus, but if they only knew the truth. And I think for us who are Christians, we can identify that because perhaps we remember a time in our lives where that was us. I remember before I was a Christian, someone gave me a gospel tract, and I got so offended. And I thought, do I look like some kind of heathen that need, you know, and, oh gosh, I probably looked like the demoniac from Mark chapter 5. I mean, I probably did look like a heathen that needed that, yet somehow I just thought, you know, how dare he? You know, Christianity. And so I can remember that in my own life. And so... But now, having been on the other side and knowing the precious Savior and His love and grace and mercy and kindness, I just think if people only knew, they think they know, but they have no idea. And what they think they know is so awful, it's it's tragic. And so we have to be very careful about that. And even as Christians, we can fall into that trap. Even as Christians, sometimes we go through certain situations, and what do we do? We begin to doubt God's goodness. Doubt Jesus' faithfulness. And on and on it goes. Or we come to Christ and we never really go deeper into our understanding of who God is. We don't really make it a priority to dig into the Scriptures and to discover the God of the Bible and Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, we we just kind of remain in a, a state of infancy, you know. God wants to reveal more of Himself to us as He takes us into trials and difficulties and hardships, and we just want out from underneath that. I know that's me. I don't want any difficulties in my life. It's easy for me to stand up here and be like, you need to endure, right? You need to press on. Don't try to circumvent what God's doing in your life when the hardships come, but the moment the heat gets turned up for me, Man, I'm, I'm ready to go, you know. I'm praying myself out of that. And so I'm just being real with you. We, we can all relate. But God wants to take us deeper. God wants to teach us more about Himself, so much that we can only know through, through trials, through difficulty, through hardship, as He wants to baptize us into a deeper understanding of His faithfulness, of His goodness, of His kindness. Amen? His provision. And so we got to watch out for that. We want the whole truth and nothing less than the truth. We don't want false assumptions or surface level knowledge or even familiarity. That's something that we have to be uh, very careful of. It's deadly dangerous. Well, moving on, verse 45. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to him, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now you might remember last week, the Pharisees sent the chief, the officers, the the temple police, to go and apprehend Jesus. And they went, and Jesus told them, you know, where I am, where I'm going, you can't come, and uh, I talked about how that must be nice to be able to do that if, if you get like pulled over by the police. Just start talking in cryptic language, and they're like, oh, okay. Well, that's what apparently happened, and Jesus, they, they had just never heard anyone speak with the kind of authority that this man spoke with. So they went back to the Pharisees empty-handed. They did not bring Jesus back. And so the rulers were upset. They were upset that they didn't apprehend Jesus and bring him back for questioning. And so what did the rulers do? They accused the officers of being deceived and the crowd of being accursed. That is literally damned. That is under the curse of God, cut off from God. I mean, that's outrageous. That's outrageous pride if there ever was, you know, an example of it. This is it. Because they point to the fact that we, the leaders, we don't believe. We haven't believed in Jesus. Therefore, if you believe, you're just ignorant. You're deceived. You're fools. In fact, you're accursed. You're cut off from God. I mean, that is outrageous. They mocked the officers as being deceived. When in reality, it was the rulers that were blind and deceived. Hypocrites, in fact. And what this is for us is a warning, I think, about pride and what it can do. Pride is the most heinous sin. God hates it. God is absolutely disgusted by it. Because what in the world do we have to be proud of? 
Let's just be real. You know, what do we have that hasn't been given to us? And if it's been given to us, why do we boast? And the thing about pride is that when you have it, you don't know it. I mean, it's like it's, all, it's impossible to see it in yourself. It's such a, man, it's such a strange, difficult um, sin. And, you know, people are very happy to say, oh, you know, look at that drug addict over there. God hates heroin, you know, or, you know, come up with all kinds of things that we look at as, you know, real sins, but not our sins, not the sin of being merciless or unkind or sinfully angry or being proud, prideful, arrogant, right? And so we see it on full display here with these Pharisees, but man, we can be guilty of the same thing. We can be so proud in our hearts. And sometimes I, I encounter it. I encounter it in ways that I just, I'm, you know, to use Pastor Dan's language, gobstopped. I'm just like, what is going on? And they don't see it at all. And I think, God, man, am I, can, am I like that? Because I don't want to be like, look at that person's pride. And, you know, I would never do such a thing. Thank you, God, that I'm not proud like that person over there. And so it's like, God, search me, show me, know me. Is, there, is that me? Is that my heart? Give me eyes to see, because that, unless God gives you the eyes to see that sin, oh man, it it's kind of seems like a hopeless, helpless situation. Let us be a church where we really do business with God and say, God, are we a proud people? Is there pride in my life? Search me and show me. Give me eyes to see and give me the strength by your Holy Spirit to repent of it. We ought to be the most humble of all people. The, the more time goes on, the more I know is that I don't know anything. I don't know anything I thought I knew. Even as a pastor, until you, when you become a pastor, you start to realize how much you don't know, how much you don't know that you don't know. And so uh, it's, it's a humbling thing. And so I say we see this and think, God, help us that we don't fall into that same trap. Well, there was one amongst them who was not blind. Verse 50. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. So Nicodemus, we know him, John chapter 3, he was a teacher of Israel. He was very high up. He steps forward, I would say, boldly. It's a bold thing that he's doing here, but also sheepishly. But he steps forward nonetheless and says that the law forbids us to pass such judgments prematurely. Essentially, that's what he's saying. Then what do they do? They turn and kind of attack Nicodemus. You know, are you from Galilee? You know, are you one of his followers? And so, once again, they just continue to persist in their ignorance. And... Uh, Really, we just kind of see that throughout the whole, throughout the whole book with the, with the Pharisees. Well, then look at verse 53. It's the last verse of the chapter. It says, And everyone went to his own house. And then in chapter 8, verse 1 there, as we move over into chapter 8, eight it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, <clears throat> you may have a... This, this begins for us the story of the woman that was caught in adultery. We all know that story and love that story. It's, a, it's, a, it's glorious, glorious passage of Scripture. But you probably have some brackets in your Bible that say something about how this text was not in uh, some of the oldest manuscripts. And so I just want to kind of address that. You may see that and think, what in the world is this? What does that even mean? And so... What we have, we have thousands and thousands of manuscripts and really fragments of the New Testament. We don't have the original documents, but we have extremely old fragments and manuscripts that were copied and passed on. That's the way that it was. You had the author who was moved by the Holy Spirit to pen inspired scripture, and then they would send it to whoever the recipients were, and when they would get their hands on it, they would make a copy of it and pass it on. 
because they wanted to circulate the scriptures, and that's what they did, such that there were, you know, there's just thousands of these fragments out there, and the kind of, uh, I believe it was papyrus, that was what they would use to write on, well, that, it's fragile stuff. It, isn't, it really isn't made to withstand thousands of years. And so uh, as these things are discovered throughout history, uh, a lot of them were kind of torn up and we had bits and pieces, but we have so many of them that we're able to take and put it all back together and recompile uh, the, the New Testament, right? And I have heard it said, this was fascinating to me, that if you just took the writings of the early church fathers in the first few centuries and compiled all of them together, we could just about recompile the New Testament based on that alone. It was really, really fascinating. And so um, we, we have uh, very, very old manuscripts. And this is another thing that's unique about the Bible is there are other ancient uh, writings that we only have a few remaining copies, if you will. But we have thousands and thousands of these New Testament documents, manuscripts, fragments, and so as you put it together, you're able to kind of like compare these against each other and see what kind of discrepancies might exist as they're copied and copied and copied and handed down through the centuries. And it's like 99.9% 90, .9 accurate against each other. It's, it's, it's supernatural, really, is what it is. Because they have other uh, ancient writings, as I've said, that they may only have a handful of copies and they are so completely different when you compare them against each other. It's kind of like this, you know, when you say something in one person's ear and they say it into the next person and the next person, and when it gets around to the other end, it's something totally different. That's kind of the way it is with a lot of human writings from ancient times as they were kind of copied and passed on, but not so with the Word of God. Not so with the Holy Scriptures. Because it's not the words of men, it's the Word of God. Amen? And he said that he would preserve his word. We have the preserved, inspired, infallible, and errant, sufficient, authoritative word of God. Amen? And so that's just a little bit of uh, backdrop bibliology, if you will. Well, we, at times, there are discoveries that are made where they find even older manuscripts. And that's, it's awesome when that happens. And... Um, as they have found even older manuscripts, they, they came to this realization that this passage was not in the oldest manuscripts that we have. And so some people say, well, if that's the case, um, we know that this was added in at, at some point. Now, some people will say, yeah, but we don't know that it wasn't, if we found even older manuscripts, that it wasn't in those, right? You tracking with me? And so, basically, the general consensus here is that this text was something that really happened historically. It was oral tradition, as was most of Scripture. You know, people saw these things, they witnessed them, and at some point in time, they were written down and passed on. So they would say this was oral tradition, as was most of the Scripture, and that at one point, before it was recorded, and that this was well known amongst the early church, and that it is considered to be a very valid and uh, genuine story. And so it's to be treated as such. And it got placed into the Gospel of John, but kind of an awkward placement. There's a reason why I'm telling you all this. And so placed kind of awkwardly. But here's the other thing that you have to do. You have to test it. Is it consistent with Jesus' character and teaching throughout the rest of the Bible? And is it consistent with the overall teaching and theology of the Bible itself? And it absolutely is. So there's no contradiction here. Uh, it's the same Jesus, clearly. It's the same truth and teaching of Jesus in the New Testament. So I see it as, as to be regarded as inspired, authoritative, infallible, su you know, sufficient uh, Word of God. Amen? And so... I just point out that the issue is, is that it's kind of awkwardly placed because it says that everybody went to their homes in the end of chapter 7, but it appears that this gets dropped down right, in the, right here on that feast, and then when this story is over, the feast picks right back up, right? And so I'll just, let's look at that. So 753, um, 
It says, and everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And then if you flip over into chapter 8, at the end of this story, verse 12, it says, then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. So that appears to be the natural flow. You understand? You following me? That appears to be the natural flow of this text. So the, the story just drops right down in the middle of it right there. And so we're going to look at the story now. But I just want you to understand, this, this apparently happens right in the middle of this feast, or right on the last day, for whatever it's worth. Just thought I needed to address that so you would understand what's going on in your Bible there. Cool? All right. Well, let's look at it. Verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such, that, uh, such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So here in the story, we have Jesus sits down to teach. I've heard it said that that was the common practice. The rabbi would sit and teach, and everybody else would stand and listen. That sounds pretty nice. <laughs> Could you all imagine that? If I were just sitting here and you all had to stand the entire time, boy, you all would be looking for some 15-minute sermons then. I'm telling you. So, uh, yeah, so here Jesus is, and he's assuming the role of the rabbi, you know, the role of the, of the teacher, the one with authority here. And um, the scribes and the Pharisees, those who were uh, you know, regularly hostile and testing Jesus, show up. True to form, they bring a woman who is caught in adul- adultery. In the very act, they say. And what's so fascinating about that is where's the man at? You know, they don't have the man. And I've heard people speculate that it could have been a Pharisee or something, you know, and so they just conveniently left that out. And so they bring this woman here, and they say, we have a woman here who was caught in the very act of adultery. And so what do they do? They want to test Jesus, so they appeal to the law, and they say the law says that one ought to be condemned to death. And so they're setting a trap for Jesus here. Now, if Jesus were to say, you're right, stoner, I mean, that would, you know, instantly, they would say, man, this is not the guy that we thought he was. This isn't the, the man with gracious words and, and a friend of sinners. And, and as we have uh, sung earlier, the Savior of sinners, this is a, a harsh man, a hateful man. But conversely, if Jesus says, do not stone her, now we find him speaking in contradiction to the law. And so they're so sure that they've got him, Right. And so, uh, what does Jesus do? He doesn't do anything. You know, he wasn't at the whim of of these folks. You know, he just ignores them. I like, I love that. You know, they didn't twist his arm. They weren't in control of the situation. Jesus just ignored them, and we're told that he began to write in the sand. This is really fascinating. This is the only time we have anything of Jesus writing anything. And uh, I wonder what he wrote. I heard a pastor say we were in a pastor's gathering and we had to go around the dinner table and say if we could ask God one thing, what would it be? And one pastor said, what did Jesus write on the ground there? And I thought, man, that was good. Man, I couldn't, I couldn't beat that one. Verse 7, so when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. So the Pharisees were persistent and insistent that Jesus give give them an answer. And so Jesus responds with this glorious phrase that whoever is without sin cast the first stone right we know that phrase very well and we love it whoever is without sin cast the first stone 
And so this doesn't, let me just tell you what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean that we're not supposed to be accountable to one another. This doesn't mean that we're not allowed to call our brothers or sisters out if they are in sin. Now, we're not here to be sin-sniffing police dogs, right? We're not the Holy Spirit police. Uh, we're not to, you know, stand in judgment of one another. And that's really what's going on here. They have condemned this woman, right? They are standing in condemnation. How dare you? I would never do such a thing. You deserve merciless judgment, Right? That's the spirit here. That's the attitude. And we as Christians who have been forgiven an infinite debt can never stand in condemnation of another person. So that, that's the idea. So these guys were just as guilty before God as she was. Just as guilty, if not more so. And they were ready to see her killed. And so uh, Jesus responds with that glorious statement. They have no right to stand in condemnation of this lady. You understand? And so um, we're told that G uh, Jesus begins to ride on the ground again, and they were convicted in their hearts, and they began to go out from the oldest to the youngest. Some have speculated that Jesus might be riding the sins of these people on the, on the ground, like uh, with specificity, you know, just like, right? And they're seeing it. I mean, it makes sense to me. We can only speculate, but that they become very convicted and embarrassed, and they get out of there quick because they realize who they're dealing with, you know. And so from the oldest to the youngest, they, they, as we say in the South, they skin out. They let out. And so um, verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So now Jesus addresses this woman personally, intimately, directly. I love this. And he asks, are your condemners, is there no one here to condemn you? Are your accusers gone? She says, yes, there is no one here to condemn. And these are some of the most beautiful words in the scriptures. I love this. He says, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. I love that. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Amen? There is no condemnation. Christian, if you are living in condemnation, you need to stop that. You need to remind yourself. Preach yourself. Preach the gospel to yourself. Preach Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Not to judge or condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. Amen? Sometimes we live our lives in this performance-based, condemnation-based kind of a system with God that it was never meant to be. Never meant to be. Our condemnation was put on Jesus on the cross. And Jesus paid for it in full. And He said, it is finished. It's been washed away. He died and rose again from the grave. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. All of our sin, past, present, and future, was paid for there by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? That's the glorious news of the gospel. Jesus says, I do not condemn you. I do not condemn you. But conversely, he says, go and sin no more. And I love that. As I've said before, he doesn't condemn, but he doesn't condone. He didn't say, now just go on and live however you want to live. He says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. And so that's the balance of truth and grace with Jesus. I've been talking about this every week. Only Jesus can do this perfectly. The law came through Moses, but Jesus, truth and grace, it came through him. He's full of truth and grace. He doesn't have to suspend one to exercise the other. We tend to do that. If we are all about the truth, we fail to be gracious. If we're all about grace, we fail to be firm in the truth. But Jesus never did that. He never failed. He was perfectly both. And so he gave her grace and truth. I don't condemn you, but I don't condone. Move forward in the power of my grace and forgiveness. And that's really what the gospel does for us. It sets us free, and it, it gives us the power to move forward and to live in this condemnation-free life. Amen? The gospel is the fuel for the Christian life. It is from the gospel that we have the ability to live the life that God has called us to live, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It's because of what has been done for us, brothers and sisters. Amen? It's because of what has been accomplished. God did for us, I love to say this every week, what we could not do for ourselves. Do you know that? Do you know that there was nothing that you could do to earn God's love or favor or to pay for your own sins? Absolutely nothing. But God, who is rich and mercy, did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, the only one who could keep God's law perfectly as God in the flesh. But yet, the only one who is qualified to die in our place as a human representative as truly man, and who is now really sympathetic. He's a faithful and sympathetic high priest because he has experienced every temptation yet without sin, and at the same time, borne our grief and our sorrows and our sin upon himself on the cross. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we would receive the righteousness of Christ. Amen? Amen. And so that's the good news of the gospel. And when you understand that, when you receive that, when you believe Jesus Christ, you receive his forgiveness, you repent and you walk with him, call upon his name and surrender your life to him, that sets you free. Born again, that gives you the power, the power to walk with God because of who you are. See, that's one of those misunderstandings that the world has. I used to have that. I used to think when I was really off in in the old life, I would drive past a church in the south. There's one on every street corner. And uh, I would think, you know, one day when I get my life right, I'm going to go, you know. And uh, it doesn't work that way, right? right? That's not the gospel. The gospel is not get right and then come. The gospel is come. Come as you are. And let God do for you only what he can do. No condemnation, grace and forgiveness and pardon and abundance. Jesus, our great sin bearer, God is in the world saving sinners. Such were you and I, right? But God, but God. And that's how Jesus can say, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. That is the precious gift that is ours in Christ Jesus. I hope every single person in this room knows that gift. I hope that you encourage yourself daily and remind yourself of that good gift. If you haven't received that gift, I pray that today would be the day that you receive the forgiveness and the free gift of God in Jesus Christ so that you can know those words in a very special and intimate way. I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen? Lord, we love you. And we thank you that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you that just as Jesus, you were God in their midst, you're God in our midst. You dwell in us by your Holy Spirit. You are for us. And if you are for us, who can be against us? Who can accuse? Who can bring condemnation against those that you have called innocent? You are the highest judge. There is none above you. And if you have called us clean, if you have called us innocent, if you have called us guiltless, who can bring an accusation? Praise you. We love you, Lord. I just pray for everybody in the room today. Lord, you know their deepest desires. Lord, you know their deepest needs. I just pray, oh God, that you would comfort them today, that you would remind them afresh of your great love and mercy, the reality that you are a God who is with us and for us. You have come to make yourself known. You have come to know us personally and intimately. Thank you that we know you in Jesus Christ and that we have all that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of you, Jesus, the one who has called us by glory and virtue pray that you would refresh us in your grace, that you would pour your spirit out upon us. We praise you, Lord. Please go before us this week. Use us for your glory. I pray that you would take us into a deeper place of knowledge of you. And I pray, God, that we would just remember that you're for us. You love us. You care about us. Not what we can do for you, but who we are in you. 
You love us, God. Thank you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.